Today's message is entitled, The Power of Jesus' Name. Now, when we talk about the name of Jesus and the power of His name, we must look, what are we talking about? Talking about the name of Jesus. And I think the best way to answer that question is to start out in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, a passage dealing with the name of Jesus. We're talking about His person. When we think about a name, we think about the character, but here also the very person of who Jesus is, what He came to do. And in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God. So first of all, Jesus is the eternal Son of God. The pre-existent Christ, He existed before Bethlehem. He is the eternal Son of God. And he did, although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself. That phrase, emptied Himself, it's kenosis, is the idea of he laid aside certain privileges of deity. He didn't stop being God, but he laid aside certain privileges. He came to this earth. He put on flesh. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men. He became flesh. So Jesus, the eternal Son of God, came to this earth, he put on flesh. He took the form of a slave. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Jesus is the sinless Savior. Jesus never sinned. He became obedient in all things, even to the point of death, the death on the cross. So Jesus Christ put on flesh. He's the sinless Son of God. He's the sinless Savior who came to this earth. To, he was obedient even to the point of death on the cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says He was buried. You know, that was prophesied in Isaiah 53. We might look at that and say, why, why is that a key aspect of the gospel message? That Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and He was buried. This reason. Most of the condemned criminals in the Roman system as they were crucified, they weren't given a burial. But Jesus was. And even though He was buried, Psalm 16 says, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus, as he died, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But he would rise again the third day, just like he said. Verse 9, for this reason also God highly exalted him, that Jesus rose from the grave, and then he would ascend to the right hand of the Father, where he is today, making, he lives to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. So when we think about the name of Jesus, we're thinking about He is the sinless, He is the eternal Son of God who came to this earth. He put on flesh. He became a man. He went to the cross. He endured the cross. He was obedient to the point of death on that cruel cross. And He died there for our sins. He was buried but he rose again the third day just like he said he would. He did not see corruption in that time. And then he has been exalted. He's been given a name which is above all names. That is the name of Lord. And he's the righteous judge because he rose from the grave. We see that in verses 10 and 11. So at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's the righteous judge. 
John says in the, in the Gospel of John that all judgment has been entrusted to the Son, Jesus Christ. And because he rose from the grave, he is Lord, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. With that background, go to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Before we prayed earlier, we were reading in Acts chapter 3 a sermon that the, uh, the Apostle Peter, we didn't go through the end of the chapter, but he is preaching Christ. And he is preaching concerning Jesus Christ that he died on the cross, but he rose again. And he says, we are witnesses of the resurrection. Friend, the resurrection of Christ is the centerpiece of the preaching of the early church. In Acts chapter 4, and on your notes, we're going to see three main points. We're going to see the Sadducees disturbed by his name. There's different reactions to the name of Jesus, who he is. The Sadducees were disturbed by his name. We're going to kind of go out of order. I want you to see verse 4 first. Peter and John have been preaching the good news of Christ. And what's the response? We see the power of the word of God. Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the message believed. They heard the glorious truth of the message of why Jesus Christ came to this earth. That Jesus came and as he died on the cross for our sins and was buried and he rose again the third day, many, as they heard the word of God, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They placed their trust relying upon the completed work of what Christ did for them. And the Bible says they came up to be about 5,000 men. Now many think that this is a running total. We know on the day of Pentecost as Peter preaches, on the day of Pentecost there were 3,000 souls, but that says souls, not men there, were saved. And we see that the church continued to multiply daily. I really believe on this event in the num large number that heard the very message at the temple that there were 5,000 men at this point in time who believed. And beyond that, there were women that would have believed. You know what we see in the book of Acts? They kept good records. You notice that? You see the church as it's growing, there were 3,000 at the beginning, and then and you kept going. Now here, there were 5,000 men that came to be that, that believed. Verses 1 and 2. The persecution by the Sadducees. As they were speaking to the people, the priest... And the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. The high priest and many of the priests came from the aristocratic class of the Sadducees. And friend, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. I appreciate your laughter. The last church I used that so many times, they, they stopped laughing. They just said, this is horrible. But I, that's the best I can do with humor. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed, there were, even though there were some Pharisees that would come to know Christ, they had believed in, that they're in the bodily resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. The Sadducees followed the, the first five books, the Pentateuch, but they rejected the rest. They didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in the spirits, they just believed in that aspect of the, they didn't believe much, but they didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. So they are troubled because they're hearing Peter and John are preaching and teaching the people concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see later on, they're filling the whole city of Jerusalem with that teaching. Isn't that great? Just a few men. 
and they are filling the city of Jerusalem with the glorious teaching. And that teaching is the gospel. It's the gospel. That Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, and he was buried, but he rose again the third day just like he said he would. And they had a reaction. Well, the Sadducees, the priests, the captain guard, and the Sadducees, they came up and they were greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. Dr. J. Vernon McGee in his, his commentary on the book of Acts writes the following. He said, I have found that the biggest enemies to the preaching of the gospel are not the liquor folk. The gangsters have never bothered me. Do you know where I had my trouble as a preacher? It was with the so-called religious leaders, the liberals. Those who claimed to be born again. They actually became enemies of the preaching of the gospel. It was amazing to me to find out how many of them wanted to destroy my radio ministry. They were our worst antagonists. It was not the gangsters, not the unsaved folk, but these religious leaders. They are the Sadducees of the day. They are the ones who deny the supernatural. They deny the word of God either by their lips or by their lives. That's important to see. The Sadducees of that day and the Sadducees of our day try to make trouble for anyone who preaches the resurrection. You can preach Jesus, friends. You can make him a nice, sweet individual, a sort of Casper milk toast, and you will not be in trouble. But you are in trouble if you preach him as the mighty Savior who came down to this earth, denounced sin, died on the cross for the sins of men, and then rose again in mighty power. That's the hated message. When the apostles preached, it, the, the Sadducees arrested them and brought them into the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees. I didn't realize this until recently I heard somebody interviewed. In the prayer gathering after 9-11 in Washington, D.C., as they were playing and singing that glorious hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. They purposely skipped a verse. The one that specifically states Jesus Christ. Jesus. You see, Jesus, when you get all those different faiths and all those different, Jesus isn't welcomed there. He's too divisive. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The charge against Bible-believing Christians, you're being too, just too exclusive. You're not being inclusive enough of all these different things. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, that sounds pretty Exclusive. How about what do you think? Jesus said he's the only way. He's the truth in life. He didn't say he was a way out of many, the only way. And the Sadducees were rejecting this, and still we have Sadducees today. They're religious liberals. They do not believe the truth. The apostles, well, let's see the apostles and what they're going to do with the name of Jesus. The apostles defending his name. There was a court. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting because the scribes, they were open to believing a lot more than what the Sadducees were. They handled the law. They were supposed to be the experts, the teachers of the law. So there they are. They're included. And they're gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there. And Caiaphas and John and Alexander 
and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? And Peter said, thank you very much for the open door and the opportunity to give the answer. I have a feeling when Peter got done, they would have probably said, we shouldn't have asked that question. By what name or what authority have you done that? And the Bible says, Peter is going to lay out the case, verses 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. You might want to mark that. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Toward the end of the chapter of Acts chapter 4, after they have prayed, the place that they were praying was shaken, and it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were being controlled by the Spirit of God. So Peter, this is a different Peter than before the cross, amen? This is a different Peter than the one that would betray Jesus, or de would deny him, I should say, would deny that he even knew him. This is a different Peter. What made the difference? Acts 1.8. Jesus said that you are to remain in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. And the Greek word for witnesses is the same word we get for martyrs. And they realized that to be a witness for Jesus could very easily mean that you would die for the cause of Christ. So the Bible says that Peter filled with the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God would come upon them and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's what's happening in Acts 1, or Acts, the rest of the book. Starting here in Jerusalem, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, and what's amazing is he's got the greatest sermon illustration there could be. <laughs> that lame man made well is right there with him. He's right there beside him. Here is this man that this miracle has happened. If we're on trial here because of this man, let me tell you about this. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Now why are they there? Because that last phrase. The Sadducees hated the idea of hearing that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. He said, you took him and you crucified him, but he has risen from the dead. And the Bible says, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Now he's going to quote from Psalm 118. And they would know this passage. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders but which became the chief cornerstone. This Jesus that we're proclaiming, that you have rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. In verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. Now why is that so important? He's addressing the rulers and leaders of the Jewish people that think that they can get into the kingdom of God by their own righteousness. That they're okay. We're Jews. We're children of Abraham. And so what happens? There's salvation in no one else. 
For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. If the Sanhedrin insist on repudiating the name and power of Jesus, they must also insist in repudiating the possibility of salvation because it's only through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The one that you are rejecting is the only way to salvation. And the glorious truth was thousands heard that message and believed and believed. Many had believed on the Lord, trusting Him alone for their salvation, having a home in heaven, knowing they've been born again. Well, the council, despising the name. Verse 13. The council has a real dilemma. We're going to see their dilemma in verses 13 and 14. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they hadn't been to the best rabbinical schools. They hadn't sat at the feet of Gamaliel. They were considered untrained, unlearned fishermen from Galilee despised Galileans. The Jews were really looked down upon in Galilee by those in Jerusalem. Here's Peter and John talking this way, so with such boldness and such a confidence. And they haven't been trained in the best rabbinical schools. Where do they have this authority? They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. They haven't sat, they haven't been in the best schools, they haven't sat at the feet of the best rabbinical teachers. Oh, but they have been with Jesus. They are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who's recognizing this? Who's marveling? Not the ones that have received the word and believed. The Sanhedrin. The council. Says, we, we can't believe that. And what made the difference? Peter was filled with who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He was being controlled by the Spirit of God. That's why this is a different Peter than what we see earlier in the Gospels. The difference is the Holy Spirit empowering. We recognize that they have been with Jesus, the one in whose name they are preaching and what they're saying. And here's more of their dilemma. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. They were silenced. Here's the man that has been healed. And everybody has seen him on the way to the temple. He was regularly carried there and laid there to beg. They didn't have disability. They didn't have social security. They didn't have a way. So why was he going to live? How was this lame man that had been lame from birth going to live? That's what they would do. He was begging for alms so he could live. So he'd have food. And there were men that carried him there. But now he's made well. And he's standing there. And they don't have an answer. They have a real dilemma. Their deliberation. They ordered them to leave the council. <laughs> We've heard enough of them. Now what are we going to do? 
And they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place to them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. Their deliberation. Dr. Charles Ryrie in the Study Bible makes a great point. He says, though the Sanhedrin forbade further preaching, they did not try to disprove the resurrection of Jesus, which would have been the simplest way to discredit the apostles. Simplest way to say, oh, this message is foolishness. And to discredit the apostles, what they're doing was to say, we have proof that the resurrection didn't take place. But they didn't do that. They did not do that. So now they have this real mess. Because we'll, we'll threaten them. Stop preaching in his name. Stop what you're doing. So we see their decree, verses 18 to 22. The Bible says... And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. Kind of a sarcastic comment because what are they? They're judging. You be the judge. Whether we should listen to you or to God. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. What did God say to do? You're to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, as you're going, you are to make disciples of all the nations. You are to be baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So they said, we have a choice here. What do you think we should do? We're going to obey God. Because our authority comes from Him. And you, you, you've threatened us, you've made this decree to stop preaching and teaching in His name. But it says, when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing has been performed. The power of Jesus' name. So the council was despising the name of Jesus. We've seen here today on the power of Jesus' name, the Sadducees were disturbed by the name. The apostles defending his name, the council despising the name. Acts 4.12, we're reminded, the Bible says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ the Lord, there's no other name given. He came to die on the cross for your sins, was buried, but he rose again the third day. And oh, how he loves you and how he's waiting for you to respond to him. Dr. Tony Evans writes the following, It's amazing. People want objective standards when it comes to everything else, but not for how to live their life. But suppose you went to the doctor and he was getting ready to perform an operation and he said, Now I think this is where I need to cut. Other doctors have ideas of where to cut, but this is what I think. Let's just check it out and see if I cut right. Is that the doctor whom you want? Suppose you went to a pharmacist and he said, well, I think this is the medicine you should take. Now, the pharmacist down the street has another view, but this is what I think. Why don't you try it? Suppose you got on a plane and the pilot said, 
Now, I think this is the button I'm supposed to push. Now, my engineer over here thinks I ought to push this button. My co-pilot over here thinks I should push that button. The flight attendant thinks I should push this other button. Well, let's try this button and see if it gets us off the ground. No. <laughs> At the doctor's office, you want truth. At the pharmacist, you want truth. In the airplane, you sure enough want truth. You don't want a pilot saying, I think, or a doctor saying, I think, or a pharmacist saying, I think. You're going to sue him if he thinks wrong. You want him to think right. Well, now, if you can respect the truth of a doctor and the truth of a pharmacist, and you can respect the truth of a pilot, how come God can't be trusted? He's truth. An absolute standard of reality found in the Word of God. The Sadducees refused to believe. The council had a real dilemma. We can't stop what they're preaching. And they're uneducated men, but we do understand this. They've been with Jesus Christ. Before we have the invitation, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, in verse 5, I love this verse. You know, a lot of believers will try to serve the Lord out of their own strength, their own ability. And to be honest with you, do a lot of times what Peter was doing before the cross. Reacting. Trying to do something in our own strength, in our own ability, our own power. But John 15, 5 is such a precious verse for this reason. Jesus teaches, this is as he's going to be going to the cross. He says to his disciples, I am the vine. They see all throughout their grapevines. Jesus points out to the grapevine and says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. He who abides, the word abide means to remain. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, the, vi the branch needs to be connected to the vine to bear the fruit. A lot of believers are trying to bear the fruit in their own strength instead of relying upon the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in the life in, in the believer. And here's the fascinating truth. The same power that rose Jesus Christ from the grave is at work in you when you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? The same power, because the precious Holy Spirit, He is at work in you. Are you connected to Him? Are you in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? They perceived that they had been with Jesus Christ. This isn't they're not speaking from their natural ability or their power. And they were amazed by the confidence, the boldness of them because it wasn't from man. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5.18, Paul gives us that command to be being controlled by the Spirit of God. Moment by moment, controlling. We need to be yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever tried to serve the Lord in your own strength? Your own power? Jesus said, you can do nothing of spiritual, eternal value 
in your own strength. Amen? I've tried before. I've tried. He says you can't do it. How long has it been since you've had that precious time of communing with the Lord Jesus Christ in his word and in prayer? There's that old hymn that says, how long has it been? How long has it been since you've really spent time communing that you've been with Jesus Christ. Our service to the Lord needs to be an outflow from that time with Him. Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. How long? Maybe you're here today and say, I know I'm saved, but I am spiritually dry. It's been some time Maybe I read the Bible, maybe I pray, but it just seems like it's a rote repetition. There's no life. Friend, you need spiritual revival, you need personal revival. But the good news is, revival begins and the Holy Spirit revives that believer that acknowledges and confesses that sin. He does that work in you. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here today and you don't know the Savior. This is the day of salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we read that phrase, as they saw the boldness, the confidence of Peter and John clearly proclaiming faithfully the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and oh, they were trying everything they could in their own human power to stop the preaching of that glorious truth that many in Jerusalem were believing. And later on, we would see that they said, you are filling Jerusalem with this doctrine, this teaching. What was happening, we see, were these men, they were connected they were branches connected to the vine. And the sap, the work of the Holy Spirit, was going through and bearing the fruits. Oh, our desire, it, it, you're glorified by this, that your followers, your disciples will be bearing much fruit. But Lord, we confess there's times that we've tried to be the ones to produce that fruit instead of allowing you to work in us, on us, and through us. We're so grateful the precious Holy Spirit is living within, the, within us when we know you as our Lord and Savior. And because he is at work in us and he's alive, it's the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, that he is at work in us. Maybe there's people here today that know you but would say, you know, I've been living for myself. I have not been consistently being controlled by the Spirit of God because I've not been yielded to him. And even this day in this invitation, oh, I pray as you search hearts, Whatever the need is, that we would not say, some other time I'll respond. But if you're speaking to hearts, I pray that this day in this invitation, that there will be response to you, Lord, and to your word. Oh, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?